Is the singing music industry dead? Hey gang, Ken Tamplin from Ken Tamplin Vocal Academy, where the proof is in the singing. I want to walk us all through a little bit of history uh, about the singing industry and just music in general. And I think this is going to be really helpful because it's hopeful and helpful, but you're going to have to stay with me to the end so I can bring some closure to some of this, okay? I think the first and most important thing to understand is, is that the singing industry has only been around for about 100 years, okay? So for 6,000 years or 8,000 years of mankind singing or however long, whatever you believe that, you know, billions of years, dinosaur singing, I don't care. But for our purpose here, for the millennia and actually thousands and thousands of years of, of music being done in villages and little towns and whatnot, um, it's only been about the last 100 years that we've actually had an industry. That's the first thing. So let's get our brains around that. So for all of the complaining and all the people, oh, it's dead and this and that. Well, it's only been the last hundred years that we've had the ability to get our music out to the masses in lightning speed. Okay. That's the first and most important thing to understand. The second thing is, is that there's been a lot of greed in the music industry that has driven the markets in a lot of odd places. And I think it's a huge uh, reason that we are here where we are today. And I'm gonna touch on some of these points along the way, but I wanna annotate that. And then lastly, it's a massive paradigm shift into opportunity, okay? And I'm gonna touch on that at the end, all right? So hang in there, it won't be too long, but it'll, hopefully it'll be worth your ride, you know, worth your time. So go back. Now, when the music industry first started, there was a lot of organic growth, all right? And I don't wanna go way, way back. I don't wanna go into the 20s and, and whatnot, but I do wanna kind of 30s, 40s, 50s, somewhere in there, where people actually had organic hits that would happen on a radio station. You know, you'd have guys, you know, driving with their acoustic guitars going from radio station to radio station to play their music, not knowing that their music was a hit in these all these towns. And when they're done on their little tours, you know, everyone's telling them, man, your hit, your song is a smash, right? So, so they didn't even know that their music was being that successful, but because of radio and the advent of radio, it was able to get music out to the masses fairly quickly. Well, as fate would have it, or as greed would have it, we had a lot of businessmen that felt, okay, what can I do to control this? What can I do to manipulate it? And how can I keep my share in my camp or my corner so that I can manipulate and control the market? That's literally what has happened. And this has been almost kind of since day one up until now. And this is true of the movie industry also and a lot of art and whatnot. So, I mean, it's true of a lot of businesses. So here we have what was organically driven music. And, and in America, a lot of it was like, you know, country and middle America music. So there was a lot of jazz and blues, but that was what kind of drove the market. And there were these bands that had these outbreaks of hits. Now come along, you know, the Motown era and Gordy and just, you know, other people around the Motown era um, started doing something where they would have their artists, instead of letting them make full length records, they would have to compete for each other to see whose songs actually rose to the top of a radio hit or whatnot. And then whatever artists rose to the top, they would be the chosen ones that would be allowed to make, you know, a record that they would push as a label and spend money behind. So instead now it's gone, it went from sort of, and that wasn't the only com driving component, but it was a major contributing factor. So as, as we drive along this journey of what happened, now you have individuals or record moguls, producers and whatnot, dictating certain things. And the first thing that happens is taking artists, finding a way to have their money generating machines, sucking up their publishing and taking their songwriting and, you know, and, 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 and royalties of sorts, and then using those monies to promote and manipulate markets. Okay. It's exactly what happened. Then it happened, you know, also with radio marketing and advertising on radio stations and it became quite a, uh, you know, quite a manipulated thing. I keep using that word. I'm trying to use other words <laughs> that are less <laughs> indicting to me, but, um, all right. So, so, so you go through this Motown era and, and then finally you have, you know, different countries around the world, the Beatles, the British invasion, all these different things and all these different styles of music. So it was no longer, they could control a single market being country or blues or jazz or, you know, whatever that was big band. Um, swing um, then bebop, uh, you know, on and through, uh, you know, the fifties and so forth. So in the sixties, there is starting this explosion of different types of music and also different levels of social, I don't want to use the word consciousness. Cause I don't think of, you know, the love 
60s love you know era as being a, a different level of social consciousness but things were changing socially and things were changing in society and culture to where it started to drive psychedelia in the market that was a mainstream market and then we started to have this British invasion that was coming in that then became a little more global okay so as information became more accessible around the world so did em emerging markets and so did other areas expanding their musical prowess and their musical uh, dominance around the world. England particularly being a, a huge example of that. And interestingly enough too, England's so small compared to the whole of Europe, but England actually dominated all of Europe, kind of dictated to all of Europe, you know, all of the different trends and most of Europe followed along. Whatever happened in England would be done throughout the rest of Europe for a really long time. So as we move forward, these markets and these moguls tried to get tighter and tighter and tighter on what they would allow or what they how how they wanted to drive a market and what that did was in you know after you kind of got through the 60s and 70s where bands were very organic and why the music i think was so great in the 60s 70s and kind of part of partly the 80s i'm gonna get to that in a minute is that um ken how does this deal with you know is the music singing music industry dead i'll get there i promise but stay with me i think you're gonna like this um so what happened was it was all about the money I mean, it really was money and control, okay? Let's face it, that's kind of how all this stuff, follow the money, just literally. So in the 70s, you had all these bands competing for greatness. Now, that's the other interesting thing is they were kind of faceless. I mean, I don't care if it was Led Zeppelin, or they did have a little bit of style to them. And, and then you had, you know, Ziggy Stardust that was very uh, metrosexual or, you know, androgynous, you know, whatever. So, so there were the sweet bands that, that were Kiss early on or, you know, New York Dolls, bands like that that dressed up, you know, like crazy. But for the most part, mainstream rock or mainstream pop and rock was pretty faceless. Yes, there was Elton John, flamboyant. Yes, there was Liberace, which was kind of Elton John revisited in a pop world. But but, but in the end, we had this 70s era that was competing for greatness. So you had a band Boston come out and they do this explosive album and then Kansas thinking, oh my gosh, you know, in our own unique way, we have to beat that. And Led Zeppelin going, oh my gosh, you know, I don't know how I'm going to beat that. Let's reach into Motown or let's reach into early blues, you know, um, songs or Rolling Stones doing the same thing, trying to get out of the Motown uh, sort of stigma that they were in and, and, and write new songs. And then the Beatles comes out. It's like, oh, these guys are great songs. Everybody was competing for greatness, songwriting greatness, musicianship greatness, uniqueness, and, and, and. Now, uniqueness is an important word here. So I want to I want to emphasize this. So up until the end of the 70s, everyone was competing for greatness, musical prowess, you know, uh, uh, virtuosity, and uniqueness. Okay, and that was supported by what were called A and R, artists and repertoire. They would be assigned a person that would walk a band through the process, letting them learn to grow, letting them fail, letting them succeed, but letting them go through the maturation process of becoming a great artist, okay? Well, that wasn't good enough for these major record labels because they didn't have total control over that. And let's face it, well, if you have bands like Fleetwood Mac that are throwing pianos out of the windows of, of hotel rooms, that can be problematic. So. And these tours were very expensive. It was at the beginning of MTV. Should I even mention their names because they don't even do music anymore? But um, you know, the advent of an original, you know, music television. You know, video killed the radio star and all this stuff. So, so as you're going through this process, everything became more and more expensive. And so, because the liability became greater, and because the risk became greater for the labels, they said, okay, we are now going to assign specific producers to manage the money of the album production. So when Fleetwood Max I think Rumors or whatever was recorded at the Village in Los Angeles, and it was a million dollars to make the record, it took two years or whatever, they're going, no, 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 we're not gonna do that anymore. We're gonna like have a producer that's gonna come in and is gonna manage and make sure that this gets done in a timely way. It's good, you know, financially it's done in a, a fiduciary responsibility to the label and so forth. So, but then producers became more and more powerful and producers became sort of the dominant force of stamping or superimposing their personalities on these bands. This happened in kind of the, at the end of the Van Halen era when Ted Templin did, you know, Van Halen kind of let them be, do their thing. You saw all these producers start to come in and the producers were actually the rock stars and the bands were kind of yes men to whatever these label purchased producers or label hired producers were. So, so, so this sort of trickled down into radio stations where the radio station didn't say, hey, you know, what's the new 
Foreigner album, or maybe they were an exception because there were icons that were some exceptions, but newer bands, whoever a newer band was, you know, Warrant or Winger or, or you know, Cinderella or even in Bon Jovi's some case, you know, who produced the album? So the labels were going, who produced the album? And the radio stations are, well, who produced the album? Because behind the scenes, the producers were maybe as influential as to the band's success as the band itself. Well, take that one step farther, and then all of a sudden the label says, well, these bands aren't writing music that we think will be the hit. Okay, let's say this again. The bands are not writing what we think and what our investment dollars, as we're protecting our assets and protecting our investment, we think will be the hit. So instead, what they started to do was chase down trends, okay? This is really important because, yes, People have always covered other people's music. So doing a cover song, I'm gonna do a whole series on this later, but doing a cover song was not unique, but it's the fact that the artist did it uniquely, okay? So they would put their own spin on it, they'd be very, uh, you know, very personal and very intimate in the way they covered as someone else's music. They put their own spin on it, represented it as their own art, and it became kind of a new piece of music even though it was a cover song. Well, that wasn't true in the 80s. So what happened was they said, okay, we not only have to have the producer, but we have to have the songwriter. And it could have been Diane Warren, it could have been, you know, there's lots of lots of songwriters that they hired to go in to be the hit maker. Well, she wrote the hit for this, she wrote the hit for this. So now the radio stations, which were the portal and the gateway, the gatekeepers to the masses were radio, was radio, they went, ah, so it's gotta be so-and-so wrote the song, so-and-so produced it, so it's gotta be a hit, okay? Well, take it a step even farther. In the mid 80s and late 80s, a lot of the producers became so egotistical and so arrogant that they stopped even allowing the bands themselves to play on their own records and started hiring studio musicians because their name was on the record and they wanted the record to be exactly what they thought it should be, regardless of what the band thought it should be. And so it sucked the life out of all of the uniqueness, out of all of the virtuosity, out of all of giving the band a chance to grow. And so they started pulling these A&R people that used to be in support of the bands to give bands an opportunity to grow over time. Um, and they just pulled that out and said, no, you're gonna do this. We're gonna hire this producer. We're gonna hire this songwriter. We're gonna record at this studio. This is gonna be the choreographer for the video. This is the video that we're gonna make, whether you like it or not. This is the record. This is the album cover we're gonna make back when they had album covers. Um, and so forth. So, this, it, so the, art, the artist that was gonna do that. So the videographers became like the rock stars. And so whether it's Michael Jackson's Thriller or like whatever, these video, you know, videographers would come in, producers of the videos. And, and so, what was left of the band? What was left of the singers? Like, they were just yes people for labels, pretty much. Some of them got their way, and some of them, you know, Def Leppard's case, I mean, you know, they did get to co-write some of their own music, but let's face it, you know, you had uh, John Lang, Mutt Lang, you know, coming in, producing all the stuff, helping write all the songs, you know, getting the sound together, da 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 And so most of the influence of that band was Robert John Lang, Mutt Lang. And I could go on this giant list of, of different uh, examples of this. So as we moved into, you know, the late 80s and struck the 90s, and I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you this is what happened. Bands became so frustrated they were depressed. A lot of them, the younger demographic, they were angry with their parents. They were suicidal. They took a lot of drugs. They looked at these bands that were the guitar players, the Ingve Malmsteins and the Eddie Van Halens and the Steve Lukather's and you know, and or you know, even Nuno Betancourt. I don't care what great guitar player that they were looking. At, they go, I can't do that. I don't even want to do that. I want to spend all those hours practicing just to do that. It's been 10 hours. I don't even know if I could ever do that. And then all these singers singing so high and the range was way out of control and the production was off the charts and, and, and they had no control. And they just went, as long as yourself and no one else. And they started kind of reverting back to the 60s. Straight up, garage band stuff. They were going back before the love area, like the late 50s, 60s stuff, and they were going, you know, I relate more to this sound, and I relate more lyrically and more as the freedom to be me and a freedom of expression, and then it, bam, out comes the grunge era, and the labels go, holy camelli, what are we gonna do now? We don't have control over this grunge era, but 
man, these brothers are selling a lot of records and a lot of their instruments are out of tune and you know, the, to, to produce a record was cheap. They've used cheap studios, you know, and, 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 this is awesome. So what do these greedy labels do? They think, okay, there's been a paradigm shift in music. So you had doo-wop, and you had the British invasion, and you had Motown before that, and you had you know the disco era, blah, blah, blah. This is just a new paradigm shift in music. And it was, okay, in a different kind of way that they did not anticipate. There's several things they didn't anticipate. So what happened to us is that they, you know, honed in or you know, uh, hawked in or pariahed in on this area. And they immediately started signing bands trying to damage control one thing get control of this market and then completely shut out and stop this market. So it wasn't so much that all of a sudden, you know, there's a new kid in town being grunge and it took over the market. That did happen, but it did it with the support of major labels completely putting the kibosh on the 80s metal era that happened because it was expensive. They had to hire an expensive producer, like songwriters down there. They brought it on themselves, but the expensive songwriter, expensive videos, expensive touring. And man, these guys were making records for nothing and touring in people's you know backyards or whatever. And that was in the label's mind awesome because they didn't have to put up the same collateral or the same investment for risk, okay? Now, you can hate me for this. I don't care if you do. It is the truth. And you can look this up. The, the grunge era bands did sell a lot of records. Even the pop era, you know, whatever you want to call pop or Smashing pumpkins -y kinds of bands. You know, the, let's call it new, new, new rock. They could sell a lot of records, but they couldn't sell arenas. Let me say it again. They could sell a lot of records, but they could not sell arenas. And the labels were like, uh-oh. We can sell records, but we have just hacked ourselves at the knee of selling merchandising, of selling out arena tickets. All of the advertisers that were advertising in arenas, Budweiser and all these big companies, all of a sudden weren't putting up their dollars to advertise behind these bands because the bands couldn't draw. Some of them could, but not, it was nothing like Elton John doing Three Nights at the Forum or Led Zeppelin or whomever, you know, some giant band, U2 coming into town and just selling out arenas for several nights in a row. They'd have to pack three, four, five of these bands together just to get an okay turnout at the Forum most of the time. So they realized that the, that the dollar generating thing that they thought that they were gonna be greedy and could t grab a hold of and, and, and dominate um, was not there, okay? Now comes the admin, advent of mp3.com and Napster, okay? A technology they did not expect. You've got guys now saying, well, I don't wanna buy a whole record for one song or two songs, because back in the 70s, most of the records were concept albums. I mean, they worked to try to make, I remember Olay ELO, the band ELO was like, every song was like, led you to another song, you know, and you went through this hopscotch of, of, of a journey through an album. It's true for Boston, all these bands. No one did that anymore. It wasn't even close because you're hiring different producers and different, you know, writers and whatnot, and all this hodgepodge, recording it in 10 different studios where you got, you know, uh, bands like, uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival, and it's one guy doing pretty much one guy doing all the songwriting, all the hits. Have you ever seen the rain? Fortunate Son, you know, all these songs in one studio in his garage by himself with the band, blah, blah, blah. Now there's five different, 10 different songwriters, four different producers, five, sometimes three different producers on one song, two songwriters, four songwriters on one song in four different studios. You know, the vocals were recorded over at Fantasy and the, you know, the drums were recorded over at Ocean Way and the, I mean, you're just like, what the heck? Like, again, it was just this package deal. And so all of the uniqueness all of the authenticity, it just all went out the window. So grunge, can't sell arenas, could sell records. Napster, mp3.com comes in. Free file sharing and the labels <laughs> their pants. Now I know Metallica was pissed off because people are giving away their free mu music for free and all of a sudden, but is the mu singing music industry dead? Here's where we're going with this, okay? So because of that, 
it collapsed almost all of the major labels and they started to consolidate. So Bertelmann's Group, BMG, and all these, oh, Sony, and all these labels started buying out other labels. And now there's basically three, four, if you wanna argue about it, four major labels left, where there used to be 35, 40 labels, and it became 16, it became 10. Now we got basically four major labels throughout the world. Major, I'm not talking independents. And even the independents use the major labels for their distribution. So here we have a conglomerate of basically suits now dictating from stock market choices of what should be released and what shouldn't, okay? Now, I wanna give you one quick small example of this. Um, I know I've mentioned this before, but Mick Zowski is an old friend. Um, we made a record together uh, called Magdalene. And um, he, you probably know him from, um, Oh gosh, he did Daft Punk, um, you know, the, the Get Lucky album, and he's, but he's done like everything from Cher's Believe to Madonna to rock bands, Kiss, you know, tons and tons of stuff. You look, Mick Gazowski, look him up. But anyway, he had said something to me that was interesting. We were, in, we were recording this record and he had said that um, he thought it was funny because he produced, I think he mixed uh, a Julio Iglesias record that was gonna have a anniversary edition or some 40th anniversary, or some, some something. And, it was owned by, I want to say it was Sony, so don't hold me to who actually owned it, but know the story is correct. I just don't have the label stuff maybe exactly right. But he said it was weird because the label had come up with a really cool idea of putting, now if you know who Julio Iglesias is, he was a, a Hispanic guy that, you know, was a, uh, all the women loved him, you know, he's a swooger or, you know, swooner kind of guy. And kind of like Tom Jones, but, you know, for more for the Latin community. Anyway, so they wanted to put out this, this heart-shaped box, right, with this 40th anniversary something, and, he, and they were gonna call it To All the Girls I Loved Before, and they were gonna put it out on February 14th, Valentine's Day. It was a really great idea. The, 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 the um, idea of the packaging and all that was awesome, and the marketing was killer. And the suits, the corporate people in control said, no, sales are down, we need this out by Christmas. So they put it in a little box and they put it out there and it basically did nothing because the suits were now in control and corporations were now in control. So that's what we're calling is the singing music industry dead, okay? However, there's still the element of now social media, file sharing, people from almost any walk of life can come in from anywhere and put out their own music and have the chance at what before were the gatekeepers telling people whether or not they could or could not get signed to a label. Now, people still use this term, oh, they, you know, she needs to get signed. No, they don't. No, they don't. There's no such thing as getting signed anymore. There's no such, so now you've got Gene Simmons and you've got, um, you know, um, I mean, tons and tons of people. You've got uh, uh, Dave Grohl and, you know, all these people saying the music industry is dead. Well, their paradigm for the music industry is dead. Their paradigm for the music industry dead. Let me share something now personally, and I know this is a long-winded thing, and hopefully it was fascinating and interesting for you. And for all you guys out there that have been around for a while, you know every single word of everything I'm saying is true. I am a Christian, and I've made some choices in my life to not go down a path of singing "Lick It Up" or or whatever you know, uh, Doctor Feel Good. Or I've been invited to sing for a lot of groups over the years. A lot of people don't know that, and I don't know that it matters. Other than to say, I, I, from a lyrical standpoint and from a debaucherous lifestyle standpoint, there's a lot of things I just didn't want to do. So people said, oh, you know, Ken, you were never successful. Well, that depends on your definition of success. I've been married 37 years and I've got a family, kids that love me and I'm doing well for myself. I think that's, that to me, I, I value that as success. I love the Lord with all of my heart and have a good relationship with Christ. So I know where I'm going for eternity. To me, that's success, okay? Let's get past it. Some of you are geeking out whether you are, you know, philosophically share my views or not. I don't really care, but I'm gonna make a point. The point is, is that about 12 years ago, I tried really hard, I have 40 records out. Go to imdb.com, look up Ken Temple, and look at all the film and TV stuff that I've done. And that's only a fraction, that's only if the production company decided to grace me by posting music that I've done. I, I don't have control over it, it's actually by other production companies that post stuff that you've done, so it's not like you can manipulate that. But go to imdb.com, put in Ken Temple, and look at the movie stuff, or look at my Wikipedia and see the records I've done. 
So here I am 40 records later and I'm, you know, I've won some Dove Awards where they're kind of like gospel Grammys and I have 14 nominations and a bunch of number one rock singles, et cetera, but it didn't pay the bills. I mean, it was, I certainly wasn't a rock star in that sort of sense. So I, I had a lot of knowledge and voice. Um, I've studied under the world's greatest vocal coaches and I decided to start because YouTube at the time I thought was spent. This is like 2008 or 9, 2009, I think it was. I thought it was like oversaturated back then. And I almost didn't do it, but I thought, you know, I'm gonna start um, a singing program and invite people to learn how to sing correctly because it took me a lot of years and I taught a lot of band members over the years how to do this. And it exploded and I had a runaway, you know, a, a viral video and, and all these years later, I get to do what I do because of social media. Now, I don't care if it's The Weeknd, who also, or Justin Bieber, or Alison Krauss, all these people became successful because of social media. Now, social media is, again, just like those labels back in the day, want to come in and, and swoon down on something and try to control it. They're trying to do that now. They're doing it again, and they've manipulated YouTube, and they've manipulated Facebook, and we've seen this all over, and Instagram, and TikTok, and whatnot. But just like what happened with mp3.com and Napster and different file sharing things, the world is changing very rapidly. And I would suggest that Gene Simmons' view of the industry being dead, and even Bono's view of the industry being dead, and Robert Plant's view of the industry being dead, and David Coverdale's view of the industry being dead, and you know, Dave Grohl's view of the industry being dead, and a lot of people that have publicly come out and, 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 and cursed it in that way, I su submit to you and I suggest to you, it's never been more alive. It's never been more vibrant in that Joe Blow on the street has a chance if they want to work their social media and, and the sky is the limit. Now, let me share one last thing with you guys and hopefully again, this was beneficial. My cousin is Sammy Hager, as you know, and I've said it a few times. Anyway, so his sister, uh, Velma, and uh, her daughter, my, my cousin, was over a couple weekends ago. And she says to me, hey, you know, I'd like to do a song with you. I've never gotten to do a song with you. Can we do a worship song? And I said, yeah, sure. So I busted out my guitar. And she picked the song, we kind of collectively picked the song, but we picked the song, the Revelation song. Now we hadn't done it be together before nothing. I just literally took out my guitar, first take, bam, we just did it. I put it on Facebook as a direct upload. And I think it was about 25,000 views we got. We had like 25,000 views in like 72 hours, okay? I want you to think about something. Really stop, stop for a minute and think about this. 25,000, now I, have a, I do have a larger Facebook, but it just kind of went a little viral. Some people liked it. it wasn't, I don't think it's that great. It just, it, you know, it moved people a little bit. Certainly not my best work or her best work, but 25,000 people, okay, in 72 hours. Now, if I was a touring musician and I played a thousand seat arenas, smaller arenas, a thousand seat arenas, I'd have to play 25 packed arenas to get that many eyeballs. Really, 25 packed arenas. Or let's put this in a larger perspective. If I'm gonna play at the Forum, and the Forum seats around 5,000 people in Los Angeles, give or take how you seat the floor, but I would have to play the Forum, sold out the Forum five nights in a row with that one song. That is the power of social media. So you can say the music industry is dead and I say you're crazy. The music industry has never been more vibrant, more alive and more accessible all over the world and stop crying in your beer, get off your butt, get your social media together, put your stuff out there and just go to town. And that doesn't mean not do live shows. I'm not saying don't, I love live music. It's a bummer what happened with COVID and everything else that's gonna, but I'm telling you, it's gonna become more and more driven into a social media market world. And we're gonna see more and more success going that route than any other route that has been an old paradigm and we've moved into a new age of the music industry. And so my answer is no, the music industry is not dead for singing. Thank you for listening to me, Ken Tamplin Vocal Academy, where the proof is in the singing. And until next time, peace out. I'm gonna sing.